And so perhaps as a way to, to start our conversation, uh, how did your, your interest in, in, in public policy uh, issues uh, uh, begin? Because I guess uh, uh, public policy issues has been, uh, have been the, the, the starting point of your intellectual and, and, and professional journey. Yeah, I don't think there was one starting point. Okay. I actually uh, was uh, exposed to many influences. Mm -hmm. And when I come to think about it, I would say very important for me was uh, the thinking that prevailed in Europe, in Germany, during the 1950s and 60s, the concept of a social market economy, where we then took it for granted that uh, Uh, embedded markets are the better markets, the more efficient markets, and that states' uh, role is to correct the functioning of markets so that we, we needed a balance of markets and states. Mm -hmm. And in that connection, I must also say I was, uh, from, from uh, my very early youth days on, quite surprised about um, the East-West conflict that uh, uh, you had uh, the more Western-oriented countries insist on markets and personal rights. On the other side, you had the insistence on state and economic and social rights. So I always thought, why not have a middle path, mm -hmm. you know, market and state uh, uh, balance. So that was a very important uh, experience during my um, youth years and the early years of my uh, studies. And then, of course, there were other influences when you think of the era of the 60s, 70s, even 80s, up to the 90s. The many countries gained their political freedom, which uh, uh, signaled that uh, freedom, democracy, and all of this doesn't stop at national borders. So uh, I had this sense of market-state balance, but beyond the national uh, context. And then I was lucky. I had good teachers like Jürgen Habermas mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, his concept of the public space. And he was one of the early uh, philosophers on civil society. So I got from him this. But then I think uh, the most important um, uh, experience was probably Uh, to meet uh, Mahbubul Haq, mm -hmm. uh, the former uh, finance minister of Pakistan, after I had served for UNDP in what is sometimes in a funny way being called the field, uh, and I was in Laos and Afghanistan, I felt that, you know, the problems of development and of global justice are not technical ones and can't be solved on the micro level one by one here and there, but that structures needed to change. Uh, so I was fortunate enough in the late 1980s to meet Mabub al Haq and his friends like A.K. Sen and Meghna Desai. Mm -hmm. and we started together the joint venture of the Human Development Report. And ever since, I think, I lost the capacity not to think out of the box. Mm -hmm. And I'm a compulsive out-of-the-box thinker. Mm -hmm. uh, I always ask myself, and that I definitely learned from Mabub, uh, why, not, why not think of an alternative and why not try to make an alternative work? You know? So um, uh, that is part of my intellectual uh, journey. Journey. Which, uh, yeah, which brought me to the 1990s. And then, uh, you know, you just look out of the window and you see how reality is changing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what marks all of my work is um, to sort of try to sense where change is trying to um, come through and then to find a way of facilitating the breakthrough. And one way of doing that is finding a term, how to name that change that mm -hmm. tries to occur. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, I mean, I probably have, uh, 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 my, my whole work life has resulted in five words, human development and global public goods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it's the fact that you are now teaching at the Earth School of, uh, of Governance in Berlin, which is a perfect place for you, uh, uh, having in mind your, your interest over the years. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's, 
Well, because uh, uh, we are focusing there on multi-level governance, mm-hmm. going from the local level via the national level, regional governance, then to the uh, global governance uh, issues. So it's a perfect home for me mm-hmm. now. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, in fact, at the beginning, you have, you have uh, three kinds of influence. One has to do with the, the historical and political context of Germany and of Europe. Uh, the, the fact that in, in Germany uh, social market was quite uh, social market economy was quite important then you have this uh, east west divide then you have the fact that uh, uh, professor habermas was uh, your, your professor how was he as a professor I, I, uh, uh, very i should say difficult he was because he is so uh, compact in his thinking and so yes. intense yes. and so fast Mm-hmm. It's very difficult when you are a student to, to follow and try mm-hmm. to understand uh, where his thinking is moving to, but one can get used to it and the more one hears him, the better one, of course, understands him. And uh, he was, of course, in that respect uh, um, uh, competing with Theodor Adorno, who was also yes. teaching at that time. But then probably I should uh, mention one additional point. Uh, very early on, uh, I decided that I would do the research for the PhD in India. Mm-hmm. This was, of course, another uh, uh, major influence uh, uh, that shaped me in my political views and in my intellectual thinking. Mm-hmm. Because being in India, again, I saw the international relations and what trade and finance and so um, uh, how it matters to the development of countries. And that actually prompted me then to, um, uh, from India, not to return for too long to Germany, but to take the next step to the United Nations. Yeah, because yeah. Um, uh, I wanted to see how states interact and uh, mm-hmm. shape the world all together. And so rather than uh, going for an academic career, career, you decided that perhaps the UN was a better route. Uh, pardon me? Rather than uh, I mean? going for an academic career, you decided that uh, uh, the UN was perhaps a better, a better path, a better route. No, it was not a better route. Uh, I always tried also to, uh, uh, while actually being in the UN myself, Mm. to analyze what was going on and to understand. So uh, I never totally uh, took off the head of an academic, Mm -hmm. but did the actual work that we had to do in the UN, but also analyzed why it was happening and how it was happening. So the combination of uh, policy concerns and, 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 and intellectual concerns. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and, and I was going to ask you, uh, how did you transition from uh, public policy at the national level uh, to public policy at the global level? But you partly answered when you mentioned the influence of uh, uh, the gentleman from Pakistan. So tell us a bit about how you, 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 you met this gentleman and, and why his influence was uh, important uh, on your own thinking on uh, global public goods, but also in the UN context uh, what was his influence? Because we always talk about this name, but tell us, I'm not sure that people outside the UN know necessarily what this contribution has been. Yeah, his contribution uh, was that uh, since the 1960s, he had the sense that uh, um, income indicators don't tell us the real story about progress or lack of progress, development or lack of development. And he was from uh, the 1960s onwards fascinated by the idea how one could figure out how well countries use their income in order to translate it into human capabilities, as A.K. Sen would uh, say. After we have worked all day long and all years long and um, really um, uh, struggled and strived to, to, to do all kinds of things, at the end of the day, Uh, Do we have better health? Are we more educated? Are we better clothed and housed? So is growth just an income expansion? Or what do countries do and what could be done in order to achieve also a better well-being for uh, preferably all of us? Uh, Mm -hmm. That was from very, uh, uh, for a long time, his main preoccupation. And then um, he came, uh, uh, he met the then administrator of UNDP, uh, Mr. Draper, 
Uh, and uh, he said, why don't we... It was then the, the late 1980s, and one could see the end of the... or, or sense the end of the East-West conflict. One saw more emphasis being given to democracy, civil society was growing. So to the extent that this happened, of course, the question how economic growth translates into human well-being became more and more important. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, when we met then in 1989, he said, what about um, trying to figure out another, another progress indicator, now known as the Human Development Index, and why not try to rethink the whole development theory and growth theory in terms of how income expansion translate into the expansion of human capabilities. And that was the motivation, the driving force behind the human development reports. Yes. And, and the, the, the human development uh, report has been hugely successful because it's now one of the uh, flagship publications of, uh, of UNDP. I mean, to this day, it's really one of the key publications of UNDP. Yeah, it is now a flagship uh, uh, publication after 20 years. Mm -hmm. But you should uh, sometimes take a look back at the rocky beginning. Yes. Because yes. Uh, it, uh, initially it was quite uh, what many people considered to be an outrageous thing to do, mm -hmm. to re-rank countries, to rank them not only to the income indicator, but to, according to the Human Development Index, where some of the other the very rich countries tumbled down to yeah. a place number 12 or 14. Mm -hmm. uh, then it became even worse when we dared to uh, link to the Human Development Index, the Human Freedom Index, and that was in 1991-1992. The idea that uh, 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 human rights are something desirable <laughs> was then a very difficult one still. Mm -hmm. And um, I must say, I have developed broad shoulders and <laughs> thick skin. Yes. I had to develop it in mm -hmm. order to survive for the intellectual onslaught that we experienced. Mm -hmm. Is there a link between the Human Development Report and its intellectual and, and policy legacy and the MDGs? Yeah, I, I must say the MDGs are a curtailment, a serious curtailment of development mm -hmm. and of human development. Mm -hmm. Because what we conceived as human development is a very complex, broad-based development process that at the end of the day results in improved health, better education. The MDGs, in my view, are very much laser beams. Mm -hmm. They look at how many calories do you need to be stronger, mm -hmm. or how much education, probably a little bit more education. But then the question is, from where does the income come? Because income is important. Uh, mm -hmm. It only has to translate at the end of the day into better health and better education and things like this. But uh, the MDGs, in, for, for my feeling, go in two direct a way towards improving ones, mm -hmm. the, uh, the well-being of people. And I'm always asking myself, after 2015, whatever we may have achieved then, how mm -hmm. do we sustain it? From mm -hmm. where do countries get the revenue to continue paying for health and education and uh, social mm -hmm. security mm -hmm. of another type? From where do people find their jobs to buy whatever they need in terms of food, housing and so So I, I, I would prefer that we go back to a broader concept that, of development that has as its goal improved human well-being at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So in your, view, in your view, the MDGs, it's a, it's a too narrow approach of development and also it's not, connected, it's not connected enough with how do you ensure for development to happen, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And it may be a, a, a fostering a two-track approach that on the one hand you have infrastructure development, industrial development and all kinds of things, resource, natural resource development, going into one direction which may be harming the human well-being mm -hmm. and then we come in a palliative way and try to correct with a few band-aids the problems we create on the other mm -hmm. end. 
So um, uh, that risk you don't have if you immediately say, hmm, you know, this um, industrial approach, does it help us achieve human development? Does it take human development into account or infrastructure development of another type? So I would rather have it always as a goal orientation of mm -hmm. all development efforts we undertake. What we intend to do, we say climate-proofing development. We yeah. should also do human development proofing of uh, the development. So in a way, the, the, the MDGs are not enough integrated and not enough holistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Not linked to all the other elements. Yeah, not, not, not linked, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, what, what, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> No, no, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. When you started, I mean, to think about uh, global public goods, because uh, your, your, your thinking about uh, global public policy has been very much focused on global public goods, uh, so more than 15 years ago, uh, you did in the context of, of a reflection on uh, international cooperation. In fact, the, the title of the first book was very much uh, uh, International Cooperation in the 21st Century, Global Public Goods. So, so, so uh, at the time, let us say in the in the uh, 90s. I mean, what was the state of, of of international cooperation? What was, in your view, uh, right about this state of international cooperation? And what was wrong, or at least what was limited, so that you know you were calling for going further? Yeah, maybe first to link it to human development, since we yeah. discussed mm -hmm. this. Uh, I was intrigued by the. Uh, 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 definition of poverty, you know, it's um, uh, a dollar a day or whatever. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But imagine you are a poor person with one dollar per day in a country which has a very denuded public domain. Mm -hmm. No, uh, no uh, public transport, you have to pay for your education, you may not have uh, public water provision then your one dollar um, doesn't carry you very far, you know, yes. because you may have to spend it on a bus ride. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, a, a poor person with one dollar a day in a country where the public domain is well stocked with all these public goods and law and order prevails and a justice system exists, the one dollar gives you uh, the money for the private goods, but you have the supporting uh, public goods. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 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 in the um, uh, mid-1990s, uh, uh, I felt more and more that we all had turned into sort of market specialists, you know, mm -hmm. we, we got very familiar with markets, but when I raised the question of, and what about public goods, people looked at me puzzled. The term had sort of vanished you know, into the uh, background. And then when I started thinking more about how to stock the public domain in a pro-poor way, um, I realized that today you can hardly have any public good provided through national public policy action alone. You know, mm -hmm. Law and order mm -hmm. is being influenced by what happens elsewhere and spills into, <laughs> into the, the uh, national public domain. Your health conditions depend on disease eruptions elsewhere, our little savings that we might have can be wiped away by, by the next financial crisis. So whatever public good you think of, it has in the, as a result of greater economic openness been globalized. Mm -hmm. Either we now insist, like in the case of property rights and even other legal concerns, that they be provided in a harmonized way so mm -hmm. that markets can better integrate. That's one type of globalization of public goods. Or spill-in effects from abroad affect national public goods. So I, uh, it was not really possible any longer to just think about the narrow concept uh, of national public goods or local mm -hmm. public goods. But uh, 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 we had to develop a notion of global public goods. That too, for another reason. Because in, uh, you remember the Earth Summit in 1992? It said very clearly that the global environment concerns should be addressed through new and additional resources. 
-hmm. And everybody nodded, yes, sure, new and additional resources. Why? Because the global environmental concerns are the concerns of the North and the South, and of more of the North than the South. Mm -hmm. However, what happened when we actually dealt with these concerns was that at least in donor countries, people were sticking their hands into the ODA budget, the mm -hmm. pot of money available for fighting poverty and helping developing countries. And up to 30% in the late uh, 1990s, already up to 30% of ODA went into these global concerns. So I thought, you know, it was obvious that we would confront more and more globalized public goods and would have to deal with them also in a cross-border way, operationally. Uh, so I thought it's time to separate the two strands, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. preserve the uh, aid for an eighth strand, S8, the 0.7% that we never achieved, <laughs> uh, and then to insist that really the global concerns be met out of new and additional resources. You know? mm -hmm. And what was going totally crisscross is that uh, we, we, we wanted to preserve the rainforest and gave Brazil or Costa Rica a little bit of aid, you know? but it wasn't aid. We were buying there as an international community through the Global Environment Facility very precious new goods, mm -hmm. CO2 mm -hmm. reduction. Uh, so why use aid for that? So that was one problem at the time. And you asked what is going, was going wrong with international cooperation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was going wrong is this confounding of aid and global public goods provision the money of aid being siphoned off for the global public goods. At the same time, that due to the end of the East-West uh, conflict, the aid budgets were plummeting. You know? After mm -hmm. the East-West conflict ended, aid went from about 0.36% uh, of the donor income, donor country's income, to 0.22%. Mm -hmm. So we had less aid, and at the same time, siphoned off funds in order to meet these global challenges. So um, in the interest of achieving better stocked human uh, uh, public domains in all countries, North and South, mm -hmm. um, in the interest of preserving aid money for aid purposes, and in the interest of not underfinancing global public good concern, I started this work um, on global public goods. Yeah. And, and, and in terms of the nature of international cooperation at the time, so you just mentioned that one of your problems had to do with uh, uh, the amount of resources and the misallocation of resources, if you will. What about, uh, what about the norms of international cooperation at the time? Did you feel that they were satisfactory enough? And, and thirdly, uh, did you feel that uh, uh, international cooperation, how it was envisioned and operationalized in the context of the UN, of the uh, Britain with institutions, did you, think, did you feel that it was effective enough and, and, and thick enough? I mean, because, you know, when we think about the European Union, the European Union is clearly an exercise of uh, public policy at the regional level, but uh, at the global level, we don't really have an exercise of public policy. Uh, so, you know, these ideas, these concerns, did you have them in your mind? I mean... Uh, yeah. No, uh, um, good that you come back, because um, what happened also uh, after the end of the Cold War is not only that the aid money went down, at least temporarily, now it has come up to 0.33%, if I'm not mistaken again, but a whole flip-flop occurred in the um, uh, aid approach, because I, when I joined UNDP, uh, we still followed the uh, uh, original approach of very much country-driven um, aid programming. And uh, I, when I got my, my initiation into the philosophy of UNDP, I was advised that governments set the priorities and we are there to assist and facilitate and help and so. But then in the early 1990s, this flopped. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we started introducing conditionality, 
you refer to the Bretton Woods institutions, you will remember the structural adjustment programs. Mm -hmm. you know? And suddenly there were prescriptions in terms of economic openness and privatization and uh, uh, fiscal discipline and cutting social expenditures and uh, so on and so forth. So, um, and this in a way uh, led to a problem of ownership, as we then later on uh, realized. And uh, the more conditionality came, and also conditionality in the UN context in terms of thematic trust funds. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, however desirable democracy promotion and gender issues and so all this is uh, desirable, but it came sort of uh, in an isolated way in thematic trust funds rather than, as we discussed before, integrated into a broader development um, approach. So many things started to go wrong then, and you see the result and the recognition of these um, uh, shortcomings and weaknesses now when you listen to some of the duck statements. You know, the more A declined, and the more conditionality came, the louder was the call for ownership. Mm -hmm. in, in earlier days, there was no problem of ownership because countries were the main um, uh, setters of national priorities. You know, so there mm -hmm. was the owner ownership there. So we, we, for a long time, we sort of had had problems to find the right policy dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm all for for policy dialogue. But there must, I mean, we must respect the sovereignty of the countries that we, after all, granted all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by coming with conditionality, you even risk weakening sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Now, then the other problem that went wrong at this time and why global public goods um, uh, came to our mind is global public goods concern us all. Mm -hmm. you know. But the decision making um, uh, uh, bodies often only contain some, the more powerful countries, mm -hmm. so that a few countries decided on matters that concerned all. You know, uh, think of the emergence of the G8, and the G8 became a very powerful body, uh, declaring on itself on the big issues. We then in the UN or the Bretton Woods institutions, we listened to what the G8 community said and tried to sort of relate to it. So you had actually more and more a few countries discussing issues that de facto concerned all. At the same time, I'm happy to say, despite all shortcomings, development happened. Mm -hmm. you know? It happened. And, uh, that, uh, as, and therefore we uh, now have the term of BRICS and the emerging markets, mm -hmm. you know, and many more countries are following the BRICS. So whatever went wrong, irrespective of that, development happened. Mm -hmm. And as a result, international power relations changed. Mm -hmm. And today we are in the, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an indestructible optimist. I think reality always is asserts itself. Huh? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now I see that we are moving into, or beginning to move, let's say, into uh, multipolarity, as we call it, you know, more, more competitive uh, uh, international policy dialogue. And that's much more appropriate for discussing global issues like mm -hmm. climate change mm -hmm. or health problems or financial stability. So, yes, many things went wrong, but we are already... Uh, about to uh, see windows of opportunity to correct what mm -hmm. went wrong. Uh, uh, and so in the early 90s you mentioned that somehow with the introduction of this notion of, of, uh, of, of conditionality rather than uh, allowing countries to be the drivers of their own development, uh, uh, international organizations, uh, Britain with institutions and so on, uh, somehow dictated the terms, right? Yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And, 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 you, 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 and so it created all kinds of problems, but you just also mentioned that uh, 
despite all this development happened and I always wonder I mean what was the impact of, uh, of the international organizations on the development of, of uh, the BRIC countries I mean on China on on Brazil I mean because in the end you know these, these countries I mean especially China had a very very strong national agenda and and they had a plan for themselves which they essentially uh, drove on their own or am I wrong I mean you know what was the impact of all these uh, uh, international organization development policies on uh, the development miracles of these countries? No, uh, there was definitely an impact, but uh, I think one has to uh, envision the whole policy development process as a constantly churning loop, policy loop. Mm -hmm. You know, because yes, in um, in the UN or in Gen um, in the UN in New York, UN in Geneva or in Washington, uh, uh, the the organizations put out ideas, be it human rights or gender issues or you know um, uh, the, um, on the more economic side, the structural adjustment, conditionality, and so. On. But then we put these ideas out into the world, and then one can actually empirically show, and I have tried to do this, they are being picked up by all kinds of people out there, be they civil society, business, or government uh, uh, actors, and they are then trickling down, in, in case of ideas, trickling down actually happens. Uh, mm -hmm. And after some time, you see that uh, when you study the women's movement or the human rights movement or the environmental movement or even uh, the business community and ideas about property rights and so on and so forth, uh, from the national level it comes back up and then we have yet another uh, resolution at the uh, UN and say, hmm, let's even strengthen this and that further and then it again goes to the regional and the national and the local level mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, so there is a constant loop churning and um, as a result, um, you know, certain things get mainstreamed, certain ideas. Mm -hmm. So yes, our nagging at the international level has had effects, but we cannot say as the UN or as the World Bank that we, as a result of our activities, so many children more. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Educated. Mm -hmm. No, we contributed to it probably in one way or the other. Yeah. But uh, I would prefer that uh, we give much more credit to yeah. governments also, um, to all kinds of other actor communities. And I think it would uh, would give us all a better feeling. No, we 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 one shouldn't say it's due to me. No, it's mm -hmm. due to all of us. Yeah. Reality is very complex. But, but uh, in fact, you are mentioning that uh, one of the key uh, uh, expressions of influence and vectors of influence for the UN or for international organization is not necessarily is not necessarily about the amount of money which is you know dispersed. It's about really uh, the, the 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 blossoming of ideas and of norms and how somehow they become part of the. Uh, public discourse at the international level, at the NGO level, at the NGO level, and then at the national level, and so on. Yeah, no, ideas are, are very powerful, and in addition, I should add, you have to wait for the right moment, you know, mm -hmm. and that the example of Mabubul Haq, to whom I referred earlier, um, uh, shows how important repetition is, you know, because uh, he said human development or human con improvement of human condition, he called it, in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. But then it was not the right moment because at least internationally we were not supposed to look into countries and to comment on countries in the East mm -hmm. or the West. You know, we dealt with international relations. Mm -hmm. But then after the end of the Cold War, there was the right moment that human development could break through. So uh, I think that is a study I'm doing at present, a study about time. Time. You know, I took some of the key challenges now floating around, like climate change mm -hmm. and other things, and looked when did they first pop up. 
Mm-hmm. And once we recognize that we have a problem, how do we deal with these problems? And, <laughs> you know, when do they have a chance to break through? And I would say you have to give sometimes, and many times, good ideas 50 to 60 years. Mm-hmm. So when you're even... The yeah, so yeah, so you know, so in 1975, the first conference, but look how far we have come. Yeah. Yeah. So when is a question recognized uh, in the uh, public consciousness as, 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 as a question, and then, you know, how do you, and, and when is the right time to put it uh, on the agenda and to make it part of the agenda? Yeah, and if you think you have a good idea, never give up. Just mm-hmm. repeat it. <laughs> so <laughs> reiteration, yeah. reiteration, reiteration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because until it's six Yeah, yeah. And and that's the value. The, sorry, that's the value of the UN. I think mm-hmm. you know many people say, "Oh my God, yet another resolution on this topic." Yeah, but as long as the problem isn't solved, just repeat it, yeah. mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. maybe one day it flies. So, so, so the ability to hammer and hammer and hammer. Yeah, you mm-hmm. have to wait for the right moment. Yeah, uh, and also it seems to me that uh, one of the, I mean, uh, one of the key aspects of your work is is trying to 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 go from simply a normative approach to development with a more operational approach to development, and that's why I guess for you the notion of of public policy at the global level through uh, this focus on global public goods is so important. So th- yeah, uh, basically, I'm not a normative person. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a very um, uh, much a, um, what shall I say, more um, uh, empirically oriented mm-hmm. person. Uh, because when you see what we have written in these books, everything is happening in a nascent way already. Mm-hmm. And I think that's uh, what we try to, to do in these volumes on global public goods and the new public finance is to say here, you know, we are facing a new set of policy challenges. You know? mm-hmm. We can of course just say, oh, we have their environmental problems and their global health challenges and in the back we have global financial problems and so on. No, they all share one thing, they are global public goods. You know? mm-hmm. And for for the benefit of whoever listens to this interview, we should probably say that there is nothing good about public goods. Mm-hmm. There are things in the public domain. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you uh, may, uh, uh, you know, if you are living in the far north, maybe you would prefer a little bit of global warming, so mm-hmm. that the ships uh, can better break through the ice. You know, in other parts of the world, people may suffer from uh, global warming. Or um, uh, financial stability, we have different priorities and preferences, you know, for a woman in Ethiopia um, fearing death in childbirth. Mm-hmm. Financial stability is a far away issue, you know, <laughs> especially if she is poor. But for mm-hmm. others, it's a very uh, priority topic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, we, we have to, uh, but therefore voice reform is important because we, are fi- we, we all are affected by these problems in one way or the other. We have different priorities for them and therefore we have to have a forum where we all can have an effective say mm-hmm. about these uh, matters. Uh, you know, we, we have talked about public goods so far, I mean, the notion of global public good, but we haven't uh, uh, put forward a definition of the notion of public good itself. You know, if yeah. you had a, a, a definition to offer, what would a public good be and uh, what distinguishes a, a, a public good at the national level from a public good at the global level? Yeah. Just for the audience to, to yeah. be... Yeah. The, the simple definition is that Public goods are things, conditions, or real products uh, in the public domain. Mm-hmm. You know, at the local level, I could refer to a street sign. When you read the street sign, like First Avenue, the 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 the, the script doesn't vanish or gets mm-hmm. faint. I can still see it or two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So public goods are things in the public domain, and many times these are things that, as economists say, are non-rivaling consumption. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. We can yeah. all look at a candlelight and it doesn't get dimmer. The candle may burn down, but the light that isn't effective, affected whether 10 people look at it or only uh, oh. one person. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, then, uh, as a result of greater openness of national borders, public policy domains, national domains, have become interlocked. Mm -hmm. And therefore, our health conditions have become interlocked. Let's say the health conditions or financial stability conditions or you know, law and order conditions. Now, this, when you think in terms of these interlocked national policy domains, it becomes immediately evident that global public goods are something very local and national, but at the same time they are cutting across borders. Mm -hmm. So global public goods are not something out there like a colorful balloon or so hanging on the ceiling or in the sky. No, they are transborder issues. They ignore mm -hmm. national borders. They cut across. And we did the studies uh, showing that the bulk of corrective action on, on underprovided global public goods like climate stability has to happen nationally and locally. And uh, all of us, we have to change our production and consumption habits and reduce energy mm -hmm. and uh, pollution uh, emissions. You know? So the global public goods, if they are to be adequately provided, emerge from a very complex summation process worldwide in many cases. Uh, sometimes some countries hold the main key, but often we all have to contribute to it. We all have to wash our hands mm -hmm. in order not to let diseases travel. Uh, so one shouldn't be tempted into thinking that the um, uh, growing importance of global public goods requires more and more and more action at the international level. To some extent, yeah, in terms of defining the marching orders, yeah, yeah we all will do something about climate change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then the main action can be taken nationally and uh, uh, markets are very important. Mm -hmm. you know? When you now think what happened in Cancun, where we decided rather than to come top down as we tried up to Copenhagen in the climate change area, first setting the global norms. Now in Cancun I get the, got the feeling that we are thinking, hmm, maybe we go the technology route. You know? mm -hmm. Green cars, better building materials and better refrigerators and all of this will help us reduce uh, uh, emissions. So there you see that even markets and private firms can may make major contributions. There's only one problem with that, and therefore the Green Fund. Okay. You know, people are, must have the purchasing power to, mm -hmm. to uh, buy the goods that embody this new uh, technology. But um, in short, public goods are things in the public domain. Mm -hmm. the, uh, some have local value, like a street sign, or some um, contained within a national border, like uh, I, uh, you know, a national justice system, but many cut across national borders, and therefore they have created policy interdependence, yeah. and policy interdependence means when I want to bring you on board, you know, also to do something, let's say again, about climate change, mm -hmm. international cooperation has to happen voluntarily. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I have to entice you to cooperate with me. I have to provide mm -hmm. the nice incentives so that incentives. you come voluntarily on board. Because if there are so many people who have to chip in, they all must do it voluntarily and they must think, oh, that makes sense. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so the big problem today is that our diplomats, mainly, and many other policy makers on the, on the governmental side, are still stuck in yeah. the old world order thinking, you know, where we had more closed borders and where international cooperation was more competitive than cooperative, mm -hmm. you know, where we had power politics. But uh, you can't 
use guns against uh, viruses or bacteria that cause diseases and you can't bomb in financial stability. You have to persuade and offer incentives and be fair. Uh, yeah. And uh, today, sometimes fairness is still lacking internationally and therefore we are now in a situation where we are breathlessly rushing from crisis to crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned two things. First of all, I mean, I, I think that one of the constants of, our work, of your work is that uh, you, you argue that uh, global public goods are underprovided and underprovided in many ways. I mean, for lack of coordination, for lack of uh, proper conceptualization, for lack of pro proper division of labor between the local, national, and global levels, for lack of resources, and so on. And then. Uh, you know, in a way, you also just uh, added that uh, uh, global public goods are also underprovided because the people who are in charge of conceptualizing and negotiating and managing the global order, these diplomats, somehow don't have the right uh, mindset. So the question is, how do we give them a better mindset? Are we, tra how, are we training properly? The, the, I mean, you know, and you are teaching at the uh, Erdrich School of, Gober of, of Governance in, in Berlin. I mean, are we training uh, the right way the people who are in charge of, uh, as diplomats, uh, as decision makers, who are in charge of uh, conceptualizing, negotiating, managing uh, this uh, new world order? So two questions. Yeah, I must, I must say, um, academia uh, has let down policy makers too. You know? mm -hmm. Let's stay with climate change. Yes, we do have the Nick Stern report on the economics of climate change, mm -hmm. where he shows that um, according to his assumption and the values he uses in his cost-benefit analysis, uh, it pays to act quickly and decisively. But then, you look at the literature on cost-benefit analysis. Any policymaker who, who tries to look at this literature, his or her head must be spinning because mm -hmm. then people start quibbling with, <laughs> with how to deal with uncertainty and how to deal with a longer time perspective and what priority really to attach. Uh, you know? So Nick Stern's analysis is a global analysis uh, looking like a sort of um, nice um, uh, planner at the world as a whole, for the world as a whole, it would really pay to act decisively. But then some countries are still poor, others are rich, and so we have these different uh, priorities. And therefore we would need very disaggregated cost-benefit analysis in order to, for each country to see to what extent it also pays for them to start acting now. And if we had this different uh, disaggregated analysis, we would also know which incentives to provide to countries. Yeah? Mm -hmm. How do we tip their incentives to come on board now and to act decisively or um, uh, uh, to, to change uh, certain technologies, move from coal to, to solar energy or so. So, there is still a lot of research to be done. Uh, we have, uh, from a natural science side, we have looked at many problems, so in the finance area the same, but the incentive side, uh, or the public policy side, we are sort of uh, hesitant to look at because we may find out that we, <laughs> that we have to, uh, um, that effective international cooperation costs us a bit more than it, mm -hmm. uh, we, we uh, do now. And that relates to the other problem. Policymakers still look at the public expenditures that are required for things like fighting diseases or climate stability as costs mm -hmm. and expenditures. But it would be better to say this is an investment investment yes into our well-being because no um, no um, entrepreneur who wants to set up a steel plant would say oh my god it costs so much i better leave it yeah mm -hmm. no 
they think in terms of investment and what will be the return down the road. You know, yeah. And mm -hmm. it will be a profitable undertaking. So correcting, we in the I think in um, the 2003 book we did some cost-benefit analysis where we showed that inaction can be up to 400 times as expensive mm -hmm. than taking corrective action. You know, so somehow we researchers and academics, we let down the policy makers, yeah. we don't give them enough uh, to really base themselves on, to, to change their mindset. But in a way to somehow change our view on public finance and, and move away from cost and, exp and expense and, 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 and spending and view it in terms of investment, we, we would need to have better tools of monitoring uh, how the money is being spent and what kind of returns it well, generates. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, from a research point of view, from a, from a teaching agenda point of view, you know, how do we somehow change the, the, the way we, we think, the way we do research, the way we, you know, uh, institutionalize research so that precisely we, we also contribute to the, to the change or to the, to the transformation of how we think on these issues? That's a very hard uh, nut to crack, because uh, for the new public finance book, yes. we, did a uh, we did a survey of um, uh, textbooks on public economics and public finance the world over. I think altogether we looked at some <laughs> 150 textbooks. And what we found was something very amazing. All textbooks, that are being used in the university as basic teaching material, uh, except for three to five uh, out of this whole lot, are based on the assumption of a single closed economy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then we went to some of the textbook authors and said, you know, how come you still make this assumption? And there is a <laughs> collective action problem there too because um, if one author would start changing, the publisher fears that they may lose the market for this textbook because yes. it's different. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And the same happens uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> for economists to get their articles placed in good journals like American Economic Review. You better repeat an established theory and apply it to another aspect yeah, yeah. rather than innovate and take the risk of maybe in the first place coming up with an idea which needs a lot of change still, but at least breaks open the, the mm -hmm. debate. So um, there, there is a serious uh, obstacle in, in academia. And yeah, we need the UNU. Mm -hmm. And um, I think people like like us yes. to just dare, dare yeah. being different, you know. And uh, we now see when you, when, you, when you Google Global Public Goods, the first book came out in 1999. It's mm -hmm. only now that it really uh, uh, finds traction, you know, and that the term is more and more being used. But still, we uh, we... We, we have a lot of specialized literature beginning to emerge in the health field and in the environment field on these issues, but the textbooks are still missing. Okay. So we have all these economists being trained still on the assumption of a single closed economy. No, 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 and, and precisely, I mean, you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, university programs which are about public policy, uh, but essentially at the national level, we have a few things at the regional level in the context of the European Union, but in fact, very, very, very few uh, university programs de dealing with public policy. We don't, so as a result, we, we don't have the quantitative data, we don't have the qualitative thinking on these issues, I mean, in a, in a very deep and widespread fashion. So, yeah. you know, yeah. if, you, if you had some, uh, some recommendations to make in terms of revising the curriculum, in terms of uh, uh, revising the research agenda, in terms of institutionalizing research and te teaching on, on public policy at the global level, what would be your, your recommendations? I know that uh, Mr. Soros is now funding an initiative uh, with CEU. They, they are just in the process of opening up a school of global policy. So, you know, if we don't somehow work on the next generation, it's going to be very difficult to, to introduce change. So, so what yeah. would be your recommendations in this area? 
My, my recommendation, um, uh, several recommendations are the new public finance book. And yeah. I would start with the following, recognizing that most global challenges emerge from a summation process, I would tackle first public finance at the national level. Because the problem you are facing there is that most budgets the world over, budgetary processes and procedures, do not permit the sector or technical ministries like health or um, uh, environment or justice to spend money abroad. So <laughs> these ministries are just budgeting for what needs to be done nationally. But today you can show that many times reaching out and dealing with a disease outbreak in Africa or Asia or Latin America or in, in Germany, in, in, wherever it breaks out, is much cheaper than mm -hmm. waiting for the disease to hit you and then uh, deal with it at home. So nationally finance um, ministers and, and other uh, policy makers need to recognize that they have to have a dual track budget process and th so that they can think of uh, augmenting whatever ODA resources are there for the aid purpose that, uh, that um, uh, we need additional resources. However, we not only need additional public revenue, but we have to figure out uh, uh, the right way of channeling resources through regulation, you know, or uh, providing the right incentives. Um, uh, like, for example, in the, medi uh, in the pharmaceutical area, Many times we don't have a vaccine or a medicine for the poor because aid money is being dribbled on an annual basis. You know, mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. pharmaceutical companies don't trust that if they invest in a pro-poor uh, research effort that they will actually find a market. So mm -hmm. some clever yeah. people came up with this idea of advanced purchase commitments, put 10 billion into an escrow account and so that the industry is assured of, of finding uh, or recouping some of the R&D money. So these are new instruments mm -hmm. that are required for an age where public policy is no longer a pure national thing, but where we have to think um, of the possibility that sometimes our national interests can be better served by engaging in operational activities that are not aid driven uh, abroad. Uh, so we, the, the International Finance Facility, where we, in order to front load investments in development, where bonds are being issued is another example. Then the whole, uh, you know, the weather insurance, which takes off very slowly, but AXA and uh, the World Food Program developed an example of how a weather insurance uh, can function for a country like Ethiopia. And um, I only hope that uh, much can be done through financial engineering. And I'm sometimes worried about the dialogue we have now bashing <laughs> the bankers <laughs> and the financial market actors. Yes. Yeah? I, um, these instruments are in an infancy stage, that's one thing, and they need testing and redeveloping. In addition, why didn't governments, the financial crisis is largely also a state failure and not only a market failure, you know, so we have to, um, I hope we don't throw out, out the baby of financial engineering with the bathwater of the current uh, crisis, uh, because you can do a lot more if one has the possibilities to front load money or to create new markets and uh, to have new risk management tools because in an open uh, globalizing world the risks travel much faster you know it's more difficult to protect ourselves against them so the new public finance is um, futures and options markets to to cope with price volatility in commodity markets or wherever it's a great thing. You only have to um, regulate so that speculators don't drive up unnecessarily the prices. Mm -hmm. But um, 
international cooperation has become a very sophisticated way. It's no longer just foreign affairs. It's no longer just power politics. It's very much economics and uh, economics of a new public-private type, you know, where the states uh, tiptoe and encourage all of us uh, to create, um, uh, to, to get involved and to chip in and, uh, with private goods and with great ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, uh, sometimes I think for the traditional diplomats it's a little demanding and challenging. Yes. So uh, we also have to think there of uh, constructing new curricula mm -hmm. for the uh, diplomats of the future. They have to know health issues, they have to know public economics of the new type. You know? And to add one more thought to the uh, global public policy and public economics, what is happening across the street from you in New York, in the UN, mm -hmm. is actually a political market. Mm -hmm. you know? International negotiations should not be looked at through the government lens or the public sector lens, but the, it's a, the General Assembly and other international uh, venues are a political market, and these political markets today, which I find very intriguing, suffer from um, constraints that we wouldn't tolerate anymore in economic markets, mm -hmm. you know, the f concentrated power of a few mm -hmm. countries a monopole, an oligopole a sort of arrangement. You know, there are information asymmetries. You have Lesotho hardly being able to follow the negotiations, if I may say so. But then uh, probably a thousand member delegation of Germany or the EU or the US. You know, a, a, a very uneven competencies to, to study the issues. You have free riding when it comes to the payment for the global public goods. So I'm very intrigued by the fact why we are not concerned about making this global political market more efficient. Mm -hmm. we, and that requires voice reform, we mentioned this earlier, mm -hmm. so that everybody can really fight for their interests and maybe the policy outcome would be much better. Mm -hmm. But I think we see it again emerging in the, Copen uh, the climate change process. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for me, Copenhagen was a success because uh, the developing countries didn't just say, oh, let them decide and we will renege. No, they mm -hmm. said no. Yeah? So, so the, the, the fact that precisely there were so much debates and in the end, uh, developing countries decided not to go along for you was a good sign of this uh, yeah. voice reform yeah. which is uh, yeah. required. Yeah. A breakthrough for voice reform and you saw it and you see it now you yeah. know that the tone has changed you know, yeah. quite a bit. And, and, and perhaps as a way to finish our conversation uh, you, you mentioned somehow the, 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 the need to, to, to train better uh, the diplomats of the future so at the uh, Hertie School of, of Governance in, in Berlin, I guess that you, some of your students, some of your customers of future diplomats, how do you, uh, I know that in France, I know that in the US, I know that in Asia, it's always, uh, you know, uh, uh, a challenge. How do we, how does the older generation prepare the new generation uh, so that this new generation is going to be able to perform better and really, uh, uh, so how do you, how do you uh, design the curriculum? How do you um, train the next generation? How do you get the next generation being better prepared in terms of curriculum design, in terms of even asking your colleagues to reform their ways and to, to begin to think about uh, economics and so on in different ways and not simply for, for the academic uh, and journal markets? Yeah. No, I try to uh, encourage my students, um, encourage them and fascinate them about the idea of positive sum thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, in a way, uh, interdependence is great and the uh, growing importance of global public goods is great because if we do something about these challenges, we benefit all. You know? mm -hmm. And it's much better than to go for land grabbing at the end of the day, it's a prisoner's dilemma situation. We are all worse off, you know, getting the last drop of oil or snatching the rare earth here. Or so, 
you know, no, uh, make a global public good uh, mm-hmm. thing out of it. And we can all, it's not rival, we can all, climate stability benefits us, financial stability benefits us all, so let's uh, go for it. And I show the economics that it pays at the end of the day, you know, if you if you uh, take this route rather than always throwing the money after the next crisis, good money after bad problems and so So one, uh, I think we, we need to get out of the Westphalian state order thinking, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> borders and power politics and uh, co- competing for land. And w- when you now see what we do in the energy area or the land grabbing, you know, it's it's still the old Westphalian state order politics. You yeah. know, mm-hmm. who can run fast and still get it? You know, yeah. rather than think, how do we manage the energy transition? And why does nobody talk about the water problem? That's another big issue. You know, it's coming. It's coming. So we should invest now into technology. Where do we get the water from? You know? And that is important for all of us rather than to move into water wars. You know? So why not uh, start searching already for, for new possibilities? So I, I uh, try to, uh, to uh, I always think uh, life has to be fun. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So why think in terms of wars and competition? Yeah. Competition I like where it's appropriate, you know, we should compete in markets and challenge us to get better in, in constructing this car or a plane. Yeah. Uh, but um, we must learn, that's another thing that diplomats also have to learn, when to compete and when to cooperate. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure, you have to compete sometimes. Uh, but you also have to know when to cooperate, and that cooperation, in order to work, has to be making sense for everybody. And I always ask my students, I say, would you take a policymaker seriously who comes home from New York and says, I have been pulled across the table, you know, mm-hmm. I agreed to a bad bargain, oh my God. No, that person loses um, uh, power back mm-hmm. home, and then we say, look, they are failed state, failing state. No, we gave these countries sovereignty, and that probably that uh, leads to the question also of UN reform. Mm-hmm. The UN has given something very important to countries, and that is the recognition of national sovereignty. Mm-hmm. What is it giving now? You know, b- besides reaffirming common values and norms and so, but uh, sovereignty was a good that each country could appropriate. Do we now have something to give? What countries can appropriate? Mm-hmm. Very little. No? Very. So I think we have to come up with uh, something. And uh, my, my suggestion there is to, uh, to develop the notion of sovereignty into the notion of responsible sovereignty, but even-handed. You know, spilling toxic financial products across borders is not responsible. <laughs> you should have proper national financial regulation. Mm-hmm. Pollution is not responsible. You should uh, internalize it. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Uh, so how come we have learned at the village level, at the city level, that we don't throw the garbage out of the window? As states, we still throw garbage mm-hmm. over our national borders. Yeah? So uh, a responsible sovereignty would be then something like um, the concept of freedom. If we agree that we don't step on each other's toes, I'm better off and you are better off. Mm-hmm. You know? And if I don't throw my pollution across borders and you don't do it, mm-hmm. I'm better off and you are better off. So this notion of responsible sovereignty is really freedom and sovereignty enhancing. Uh, mm-hmm. And therefore, this whole talk about states losing sovereignty, yeah, they're losing sovereignty if they don't cooperate and if they don't have a notion of responsible sovereignty. Yeah. So, so, so. so for, for why sovereignty alone was uh, a su- sufficient incentive to have people uh, yeah. coming to the UN table, no, it's not good enough, we have somehow to, we to invent... It. Yes. We have to invent yeah. a, a, a new form, I mean, a qualified form of sovereignty, which would be a, a new legitimacy ticket for, yeah. for, for, for countries to be uh, recognized as full-fledged uh, uh, partners. But also a new duty ticket. 
Yes, yes, yes. Because yes. we are all expected not to trample on the sovereignty of others. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would really look at sovereignty as a special type of freedom. And mm -hmm. as we conceptualize freedom, freedom, I don't disturb your freedom, you don't disturb my freedom, and we are free all, <laughs> all together. Yeah. In the same way, I don't encroach on your sovereignty and just spill things into your national domain, and you don't encroach in my sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, but in a consensual way, we we see that where our priorities and preferences overlap, and then provide jointly mm. and in agreement and consensus based these global public goods. No, no, this is and, interesting. This is an interesting and, uh, idea. The, uh, this is an interesting UN, idea. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the UN. Uh, what is going wrong with UN reform is today that we, without a new vision we start rearranging the deck chairs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where the chair stands, even within the current structures. If we had a new vision and something attractive to offer, you know, people would crowd back into the UN and yeah. uh, it would uh, ha assume a new life. So I think first we have to know what we offer, mm -hmm. we, the UN, and then um, the, the, the form and the conference rooms will follow. You know? yeah. No, no, it's an interesting idea because in a way you are calling for a new form of uh, intergovernmentality, one could say, based on, 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 uh, on, on a notion of sovereignty which is renewed and which uh, presents, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, updated incentives for, for, for countries to be taken seriously and to take one another seriously and so on. Yeah, yeah. It's not collective se uh, security, but collective freedom, one sovereignty. Yeah. Mm -hmm.